This conference will now be recorded. All right. Um, I'm actually sitting here on Hammond Bay overlooking the Strait of Georgia. And that's my uh, fixed address, I guess. Uh, Brian is going to change the slides. And I'm going to talk about the first few slides. And my introduction is that the reason for both expeditions, 2019 and 2020, is the, essentially the need to see a bigger picture of what regulates salmon abundance. And so what Brian and I are going to do is I'm going to introduce the reason for me saying that um, on a few slides, and then Brian is going to talk about the results and then we can have a general discussion on where we are from here. So if Brian will show the first slide, see if that works. There it is. Um, so you're looking at three graphs here. And the reason for showing these three graphs, you'll see in a second, but the reason is to show you that th these are examples of large scale trends in salmon abundance, and they are large scale trends that illustrate that there is a change in the capacity of the ocean to produce salmon. So the message is these are really good examples of major changes in the capacity of the subarctic pacific or the north pacific to produce salmon and it's a, it's quite amazing that that probably these three examples are virtually unknown to british columbians but but the top graph goes from 1925 to the present and it represents the total catch of salmon all species of salmon by all countries and what it is showing is that in recent years, the last 10 or so years, that the total catches of all species of salmon by all countries around the North Pacific is the highest in history. So we are getting the highest catches, commercial catches of salmon, and this is since 1925. So salmon production in the North Pacific is doing really well. And then the middle graph is the catch of chum salmon in Japan. Japan produces virtually all of its chum salmon in hatcheries. So this increasing trend, which got to be quite large it, 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 um, in the mid 1990s and in the early 2000s, it could have been uh, up to almost 20%, 25% of the total catch of all salmon. So the total abundance there it was very large. And then about 2004, it declines. And the total catches of salmon, chum salmon from Japan, have declined about 70% since around 2004. And because the releases from hatcheries haven't really changed much, that declining trend is entirely a result of something changing in the ocean. It's entirely a result of the capacity of the ocean, and in this case, the ocean around Japan, to support the production of chum salmon. And then the bottom graph is the total catch of all species of salmon in Russia, Pacific salmon, and it's virtually all pink and chum. And here you're looking at really the opposite trend that you see, that you could see for Japan. Here you're looking at an increasing trend, and except for the last year or two, Russia got the highest catches in their history, and that's going back to 2025. So you're looking at 
one trend at the top showing that the total catches of salmon are at the highest in recorded history, and then a declining trend in Japanese a chum salmon, and then an increasing trend in Russia. Again, showing you that to show you that these trends are caused by changes in the capacity of the ocean, okay? And then the next slide that Brian's gonna show is the last one that I'm gonna talk about. And some of you are familiar with this, but this is the return of sockeye to the Fraser River. And we're not gonna talk much about the ups and downs, but the you can see the increasing trend in general to the early 1990s and then a decreasing trend to the present and then there are some um, increases a large increase in 2010 that's not labeled but i'm showing you this to show you the 2009 total returns and then compare that to the 2019 total returns and the message here is that there has been a declining general trend with in 2009 was the poorest return going back to the 50s but last year 2019 the return um, to the fraser river was 50 percent lower than that return in 2009 so last year, 2019, we got the poorest returns of sockeye to the Fraser River in history. Now, the three the cases that I've shown you, it's fair to say that there is no scientific explanation for what's going on. And what Brian and I are doing with our expeditions is to find the science that was needed to explain what's causing these general trends. So that's my general introduction, and then Brian is going to take over. Okay, thanks, Dick. Maybe I think to wrap up Dick's comment there is, you know, the real summary to this is that we are seeing very high production from the North Pacific, but your perspective on salmon very much depends on where you are around the North Pacific. And regrettably, in the BC region in the last few years and in the, uh, the Pacific Northwest United States, it's not been particularly great. Uh, and not brand new, but the, as Dick points out, 2019 was very unexpected and extremely poor. Uh, this really is an important link to the 2019 research because we really were surprised at the low number of salmon that we caught and especially the absence of sockeye salmon we expected to see in the Gulf of Alaska. And so when we started putting the results from 2019 together, Dick and I felt we really had to go back and to try to verify some of our observations and to see whether or not we could add more information in terms of what happened to production of salmon in the Gulf of Alaska in particular. Uh, we're focused in the Gulf of Alaska because past tagging data <clears throat> certainly indicates that most of the North American salmon that we have from BC and Puget Sound region uh, rear in the Gulf of Alaska at some time. And we don't really know how long because the tagging of course was done at particular times in the year but we thought that was the uh, location to start. I should start my presentation by pointing out that what you're looking at here is the Pacific legacy number one. Uh, we were quite surprised in mid-October of 2019 when Russia decided that they were unable to provide us the research vessel we had in 2019. And literally within a week, a Canadian commercial vessel that is a Hake trawler and processor stepped up and volunteered to take on this challenge and we would not be sitting here talking about results if it wasn't for the collaboration with the Pacific uh, Legacy Seafood Incorporated and uh, with the BC Shrift people that we'll have on here and the generous donations of the fishing industry from the United States and Canada. 
Uh, I, the only other thing to note is the date. So we left in mid-March, March 11th, just before the pandemic struck. So we were quarantined in the North Pacific and we returned on April 7th. Now, without going into a lot of detail, this next slide really just pr presents our, our general study objectives. I would summarize the top bullet as saying, this is the scientific hypothesis. And we believe the functioning that now is the animals are conditioned in their first few months at sea. The fastest growing and larger fish have a higher probability of surviving the winter when we would presume the food is more limiting. And we believe that after the first winter at sea, that the abundance of the return from that year class is largely determined. All right, so that's the scientific hypotheses. The next part comes down to learning lots more about the condition of the fish. And because of the coincidences we saw between the observations in 2019 and then in the adult returns, and I would stress it was not just Fraser sockeye, we saw very consistent um, relationships between what we saw in the winter and what we saw in the subsequent return. Uh, a widespread failure of pink salmon um, widespread failure of chum salmon, probably the worst return of chum to uh, British Columbia in probably history, but certainly over many, many years. And this has drawn a second interest to many groups that by understanding what's going on in the winter, <clears throat> can we provide improved forecasting for salmon that we would expect to see back in the next fisheries? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I've, I've sort of led to this slide already. These are the groups that provided the support for us. Um, in the top corner is the symbol for British Columbia and Fisheries and Oceans Canada Federal Agency for those not from Canada on the line. This is part of the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund. They provided <clears throat> $650,000 uh, for this endeavor. And the total cost, including a subsequent uh, workshop is projected to be about 1.4 million. So we had a large difference to make up in order to make this a reality. And uh, we really could not have done it without a huge contribution from many fishing companies in the United States and in Canada, all of which are represented by their logos here in this one slide. We were joined with them by groups like the BC uh, Salmon Farmers Association. <clears throat> Hakai is the is a private foundation. Sitka is a private foundation. <coughs> Excuse me. And MPAFC, of course, is Marks International Year of the Salmon, and they contributed by providing the trawl. And that. So we can come back to that if you're interested. Now, the Gulf of Alaska, <clears throat> and this kind of struck me when I looked it up is 1.53 million square kilometers of ocean. So where on earth do you start? And that's the reason why there's a very general, what we call a grid uh, survey design here. This is from 2019 study design. And I'm losing my voice for some reason. <laughs> and really what we're talking about here, when you don't really know how to go out or what, where the salmon are, <clears throat> we start with a very general design. And last year, they covered all of these, about 59 stations in total they were able to do. <clears throat> and so this represents where they were in 2019. Our planning, of course, uh, <clears throat> so the X's are 2019, and then the lines are the plans that we had as we design the 2020 survey. The, <clears throat> the green line is the first leg out, first half of the survey. And we, we had to go into Prince Rupert because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And we had to let the Alaskan members of the crew off. And we intended to come back out and do the Northern half of the survey, which is the blue line. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as we headed out, we headed out into a very, very strong storm. And so the next line or graph really is the uh, dots 
along the sort of eastern margin of this. This is the uh, survey that we conducted on the way back, right? It's not as planned, but uh, <clears throat> we had very little choice. The weather in 2000 and, or in 2020 was not as good as 2019, but this is the outcome. Uh, the very large dots you see in the bottom, uh, which is really around 47 degrees north latitude, this is on the way out. And then we actually came back down and wanted to resample those because of the extraordinary <clears throat> high catch rates that we had seen. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when we got back there about 10 days later, the uh, fish were not where we were hoping that they would be. So that brings us into the results then. Um, I tell people that the results in 2020 were similar but different than 2019. <clears throat> so I've, I've really just given you the catches here by species. You can see in 2019, <clears throat> we had 417 total catch and in 83% of the trawl samples taken, we were able to catch salmon. In 2020, we caught more salmon, but we only got salmon in about half the trawl samples, right? So the fundamental difference that we see right away between years is that in 2020, the distribution of salmon was much more sporadic. It did not have any sort of level of even distribution by species. We also had a much higher catch of pink salmon, but those pink salmon were only caught on four out of 52 trawl samples. So they were quite spread out. And the vast majority was caught in one sample on the third trip out, one of those large dots at the bottom of the previous slide. So similar but different. Uh, when you do the math, you work out to about the same abundance of uh, salmon total in the survey area. And in both years, you sampled about 650,000 square kilometers of ocean, right? So it sounds like a huge number, but uh, our ability to sample that, of course, is limited by a single vessel and a single short time period. Now, the next two slides are really for a description of what this is. There's a lot of data here by species. There will be one of these for each salmon species. And these are directly from the cruise report. And I'll provide you a direct link to that at the end of the talk. So to start with, we'll look at chum salmon. And that uh, chum salmon, of course, have multiple ages at sea. We have five age classes observed. Actually, I guess it's six, because we had a uh, six-year-old observed this year. Um, an interesting outcome this year is that we did see a lot of juveniles. Uh, almost half of the catch of chum were what we think are <clears throat> first year at sea chum salmon. By definition, these were less than 35 centimeter in total length. And so just to tell you what's on this figure, let's start in the lower left where you'll see the fork length and the weight. Uh, this should be a nice smooth curve because the relationship between a growing fish with length to weight is a smooth exponential climb. Or it's a power function really, but anyhow. Um, and so what you find here is that we do have a good sample across the entire size range. And this will be very important to us as we do the laboratory studies. Above that is the fork length to the number of species. This is just the distribution of the catch by size, uh, similar to the, the graph below. And then when you go to the top right, it's condition factor to the number of animals. And the condition factor of a, a healthy growing fish in the ocean should be in the range of 0.9 to 1.1 and around 1.0. It's a relationship between length and weight calculation. And you see that there is quite actually good distribution around one in this case. In 2019, we saw some very emaciated looking chum. We did not see that this year. We seem to see good quality and good growth in the chum salmon. In the bottom figure, uh, probably the really least informative for you, uh, this is by trawl, <clears throat> and it looks at the distribution of fish by condition factor. So if you have a very narrow band, that means that the fish had very little variability about the condition 
but if it was wider, then there's lots of variation in the condition factor of the fish. All right, so let's go down to the next one. I chose to just provide you coho. Now coho only has a single year class at sea. And so instead of seeing a strong curve here, we see more of a straight line relationship between fork length and weight, but we actually see quite a strong relationship or a pretty tight relation. And if you look at the distribution immediately above, you tend to see that there's a number of the smaller fish and then there are fewer uh, very big fish as you get out to 45, 46, 47 centimeters. Condition factor, uh, very similar to chum, tightly around one, so good condition for the fish that we saw. And then of course, there's the example below about the distribution of the condition factor by trawl. And you'll see what I meant before, where you have very wide bounds, it means we had quite a bit of variation in the condition of the fish that we observed. That sort of variation will be very important to us in our lab analyses, because we do expect to see uh, differences in energy content and protein levels and so on. <clears throat> but we can't give you that information yet because one thing COVID has done is definitely uh, limited access to labs. So we are certainly behind at this time in analysis of our data. Just a couple of other things to show you. There's lots of discussion around the North Pacific about competition between species at sea. So we wanted to show you uh, observations on what the fish were eating out in the open ocean. Uh, and the way I'd like to summarize this is simply to point out that if you look at chum, pink and sockeye, you see the composition of those three species is actually quite similar. The big difference is really the uh, top part of chum really gets into other components and fish, uh, much wider variety in chum that we see in the others. But the majority of the diets of those three are really taken up with euphosids, which is the bright red, right? And if you look at coho <clears throat> and uh, chinook, you see that cephalopods, the yellow, the gold, I guess, really becomes predominant in coho and it's a significant contribution in chinook as well. Now, a caution that chinook, the vast majority of our samples are taken on the shelf on the returning home. So these are from a small size range of Chinook salmon in that. And so this is not a general diet for Chinook over their full size range. And I just put a couple of pictures in, in the next slide to really show you that euphosids that we see in the chum, uh, pink and sockeye, these are a variety of shrimp-like animals and there can be massive abundances of these in samples. But again, they were quite uh, broken up and that. But you can get large abundances of these food items. And the other part is the cephalopods. And this is a fascinating part of the study out there. Um, Dick can correct me, but I think we now have identified 18 to 19 uh, species of squid in the open water. And they vary over a wide range of, of sizes, but they're very common in the diet of, of, of the coho that we caught. And coho, by the way, until we started going out to the North Pacific, were largely thought to be coastal uh, species and along the shelf. But uh, in 2019 and 2020, coho were the second most abundant, well, other than the, the few chum, or pink that we saw this year. But coho out there continue actually to be a really interesting observation. Uh, just a couple of examples of the oceanographic data. Of course, it's one thing to study the salmon and all the other animals we can sample, but to understand the distribution of these animals, we need to really study the environment as well. We have large numbers of environmental uh, data points because we use what we call these CTDs. So these are chlorophore temperature depth sensors and we would lower those down to about uh, 600 meters and that, and then we get a variety of plots about temperature, chlorophyll, salinity, and we also took wind vectors. I've only included a couple of examples to show you. So this is the surface temperature in the, in the top 100 meters roughly of the area that we surveyed. And you see that the range of temperatures went from 
a low of 5.5 degrees in the extreme north, uh, northwest, and as high as a, a small area at nine degrees uh, down in the more of the southern portion of the range in itself. An interesting observation between 2019 and 2020, although we sampled very different areas, it turned out that the uh, temperatures that we crossed and surveyed were almost identical. Uh, the temperatures in, 2020, in, in 2020, sorry, were only a third of a degree Celsius cooler than 2019. So essentially an identical range of temperatures. All right. And then the other example I've included, this is a measure of the productivity of the ocean in producing planktons, the phytoplankton and zooplankton. And you can see very easily that there are patches of the bright red, which are much higher levels of uh, productivity. The area that's to the southwest, and it's got the 125 uh, scale amount, that's almost right on top of where we had the very high catches in the, the third and fourth days out at sea as we left uh, Victoria. All right, so lots of detailed information here. And really to get more out of this, then you need to relate these to all of the samples we took of the zooplankton. Uh, we read the phytoplankton using fluorescence from the CTDs, but we sampled the zooplankton at every station. We would sample with what's called a bongo net, where we take two hauls and bring them up from about 300 meters to catch uh, the, uh, the animals in the sea, the small animals that are the diet items. All right, so there's lots of data for us to go through yet, and lots of analyses yet to be conducted. So let me get to the end of some of the materials here. Lots and lots that we could summarize for you, but I wanted to return to the two basic objectives. So have we advanced the major hypothesis? I don't think there's any question that we have. Uh, we can't give you the specifics of it right now because we really have to get the analyses from the laboratories. Uh, all of that material has been safely sent back and that and is be processed as soon as these labs start to open up, including the, uh, we do what we call the DNA analyses to give you the population of origin of all the fish that we uh, sampled and that. So that I'm afraid is yet to come. Uh, and can we improve the salmon forecasting? This to us is really a matter right now of, can we conduct these surveys? Can What are we gonna get from these surveys? And Dick and I both believe that, yes, we could do more survey work and we will be able to do forecasting. <clears throat> the reality is though, and as I started out with, a single vessel sampling millions of square kilometers of the ocean uh, with a patchy distribution of salmon is not gonna be a very sensitive measure of changes in the abundance of salmon. So this leads us very nicely into what's happening next year. And Mark is going to summarize some of this for you. But in March, 2021, the NPASC and the International Year of the Salmon have an opportunity to go out uh, with five vessels and really do a thorough survey of the distribution and condition of salmon in the North Pacific. Uh, so I'll let Mark come back to that one. I think the last one I really wanted to provide for you is a more of a resource sl <clears throat> slide for you. Uh, the uh, website addresses at the top really take you back to uh, the cruise reports, of uh, which there's the 2019 is now published. That's the bottom web link. Our recent uh, 2020 cruise report is now posted on the NPAFC IYS website and that. And you can get a lot of information about the 2020 cruise at the second website. We have crew profiles for all of the people that went out bios, including the vessel skippers, uh, lots of trawl video and photos that you can draw from as well. And I'm sure you'll have questions after you leave this phone call. So you can feel free to contact myself or Dick with the contact information at the bottom of the slide there. So I'll cut myself off and just to say thanks for your interest. These are the 12 young explorers that went to the North Pacific in the winter 
always a treat, I'm sure, and that. But, uh, you know, really for two years of going out in the winter in the Gulf of Alaska, uh, we certainly were able to fish probably two out of three days and that. So uh, it's definitely possible to keep this research going and we are definitely learning things each year. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, Mark, I'll leave you to comment on this and I'll just advance to the final slide. Perfect, thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brian. I, I, I won't take it more than a minute here, but uh, yes, everything you saw uh, from 2019 and 2020 comes forward uh, to us in 2021, where with five countries, uh, we plan to conduct uh, very similar gridded surveys um, across five zones going right across Pan Pacific. And you saw interesting questions that Dick raised around the high productivity of the in the of Russian fisheries and the declining uh, fisheries in uh, for uh, coal or for chum in Japan. And everything in between sort of links to how the ocean and mechanisms that are affecting us, whether it's large heat waves, the blob, uh, the movement of nutrients from west to east, and the circulation that's being impacted by climate change. So what Dick and Brian and the work that the first two surveys have done really give us the basis for starting to understand um, how to how this survey design will work in the eastern North Pacific. Um, and we're building on a legacy really of uh, 30 years of uh, Russian research that's used this same technology and approach to understand ecosystems uh, on the western side of the North Pacific. So this is a big change. This is this is about a, a huge international collaboration. Um, we're not entirely there yet in terms of what we need to make this happen. Um, it, we have a confirmed vessel from Canada, um, a confirmed vessel from Russia, and that would handle zones one and five. And we are awaiting uh, uh, the use, uh, understanding the confirmation of the use of an American vessel. And we are, are in a funding uh, mode, uh, generation mode for zones two and three, where the intention is to charter a Russian vessel that would work for um, 60 days covering zones two and three. Um, so we're it's a it's a work in progress, but we're very, we're well on our way to sort of realizing this and making it a reality. Uh, many will say, you know, what's a good of one year? And I know Dick and Brian had that sentiment, and we learned they learned a tremendous amount in first year, and now in the second year, the third year I think will give us the uh, in total that that set of data and the new young scientists that we've got working on all of this will give us what we need to understand how to move forward. We recognize in the future it may be hard to put that many sea uh, ships together with great regularity, um, but we also have um, the use of uh, drones and other technology, uh, remote sensing technology that could be used in association with it to understand the mechanisms, uh, help us um, to build out our understanding of the mechanisms and understand what we need to be able to manage salmon and, and uh, with an understanding of what's in this black box. So I'm going to stop there and we're going to open it up um, to the media if you have any questions. So if you could, in the chat box, if you could uh, indi in, um, indicate if you have a question there and then we'll um, ask Brian and Dick or myself to uh, respond. Uh, yes, we have our first question is going to be from Randy Shore with the Vancouver Sun. Randy, you can go ahead. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yep. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, so my question was, how do you, uh, how do you, ha have you got the funding in place to engage five ships, and uh, how much are we, do we expect that to cost? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, Randy. So the, right now we have Canada, United States, and Russia providing. Um, that we would be looking to provide vessels. The Canadian ship has been scheduled, so that is um, provided at by the Canadian uh, federal government, Fish, Fisheries and Oceans. Similarly, the Russian vessel, uh, one of the Russian vessels, um, a 30-day leg on the in Zone One. And if the American were successful 
uh, in the process with the US, U.S., then the U.S. vessel, the Shimada, would be available at the provided by the U.S. government. Uh, the challenge is um, is that zones two and three. That's about a three million dollar uh, charter bill, and that one we have um, it's three uh, hundred k. Uh, at this point, uh, raised for that, um, but we will be continuing to uh, to work on that one. Right now, if I recall correctly, the uh, the Russians didn't provide a ship for free last year. Uh, did what? Did something change? Well, the 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 you know the Russians actually the the, the high seat this. Pan-Pacific idea um, was initially proposed by the Russians. They're very, uh, very keen on this uh, on this view, and I think Dick and Brian would say how supportive. I mean, they pr did provide a lot of in-kind in terms of the Russian staff, um, and uh, and they did do some sampling in that first year on their in the in the western side of the North Pacific in 2019. Um, so they they uh, as we were trying to stage this five vessel, they made it clear that they would provide one vessel um, and uh, but the second one they were not able to provide without some additional funding right I understand they provided a lot of borscht as well um, <laughs> yeah. uh, well thanks very much I can see actually in doing this exercise why my interns are terrified of me now um, so thank you very much <laughs> thank you That was it for questions. Okay, are there, uh, I know we have another, um, uh, others that are involved in the, uh, are, that are in the audience today. Are there other questions besides the uh, media? Okay, well, hearing hearing none, um, we'll close it off unless uh, from Randy's question, I don't know, Dick or Brian, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, but they, it's just Dick. Um, we haven't told people that three of the Russian researchers that were on the ship and got off in Victoria on April the 9th have been in Nanaimo ever since because the borders were closed. And it won't be until next week that they get a chance to return. So uh, it's just worth, I think, mentioning it, that they have been here and they have been working on the cruise report, which they have finished. And that's the one that Brian said is now available on that web page. So, um, so the Russians will, hopefully we, we can get them home next week. Great, thanks. Okay, well, hearing uh, nothing further, I wanna thank uh, Dick and, and Brian for the presentation. And thank you for those of you that attended and to our staff that uh, did an excellent job in, in setting it up and uh, technology worked extremely well. So thank you very much, everybody. And, and stay tuned for more um, information that will be coming out on social media, uh, the links um, and uh, the, be plenty more to hear about coming up in the in the near future here. So thank you very much everybody. Thanks everybody.